is my favorite. You don't have to understand the lingo to know that this, upside down 300 feet above the ground, is pretty amazing. And as awe-inspiring as it may look from the ground, it's just as awe-inspiring to the pilot in the cockpit. All of that mechanical engineering, aerospace engineering that goes into make, making this airplane fly, that technology, the fact that they can put that into an airplane that can go, you know, 1.6 Mach, pull 9 Gs, and drop bombs is, is super awesome. Major Kristen Wolf, call sign Bayo, is the pilot and commander for the F-35A Lightning II demo team. Her job is to show off just how incredible her plane is to the entire world. And it's the latest and greatest technology inside of it. The Lightning II is the world's most advanced fighter jet, and Bayo Wolf and her team are happy to finally get to show it off in front of the hometown crowd. This is obviously our home base. We've been here since 2019. We started practicing, skip the 2020 air show. So we're really excited just to get everybody out, especially the local community, onto the base just to see this airplane, the Thunderbirds. Uh, and it's going to be a huge lineup that weekend. So. Uh, we're really excited to put on the show. And what you'll see in the air won't just be some simple air show tricks. Bayo puts the jet to the test each and every time she gets inside. It is pretty aggressive flying. You have max perform in the airplane, so a lot of Gs, a lot of strenuous maneuvers. Proving her plane is more than ready to take on any enemy. We don't modify the airplanes, paint them, take out any sensors, anything. Like this airplane could go to war tomorrow with bombs in it, and some of them have come back from war we fly them in demos. So uh, it's pretty important to share that combat capability. Showing off the might of our military and inspiring the next generation of airmen and women, just one of the many goals of the demo team and the Warriors over the Wasatch Air Show. Gives people outside of the fence the opportunity to come on the base and see what their neighbors do, see what goes on here at the base. It's not just about flying the aircraft, but it's about maintaining them and all the multiple things that they do here at Hill. That's why it's called an open house. It's really to invite those people in and say, look, here's what we do. We do this because we protect our country each and every day, and this is how we do that. And it just so happens that protecting our country... 40,000 pounds of thrust, we're riding down the runway and then racing around uh, 300 feet off the ground. ...also puts on quite a show. It's like flying away for it's awesome. Great shots of the F-22 Raptor there, and how cool was it to talk to, to Bayo Wolf and learn about the F-35? I mean, so it, cool. it's so cool. I mean, right, how cool is our job? <laughs> the, people, the people we get to meet, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the pilot uh, uh, for the Thunderbirds, uh, Primo and, and, and Kristen and uh, Bayo Wolf, and it's just, uh, uh, it's, it's just such a privilege uh, to be out here and, and sitting right here with all of this noise and smoke happening behind us, and and I gotta, you know, all these all these people out here on the, on the tarmac out here watching this show, it's uh, really an incredible experience. Yeah, so lots more to come. You see the A10, uh, that's not the A10, but the A10 <laughs> is supposed to come up. F22 is coming up. The F35 is going to come up later on this afternoon. The Thunderbirds, the headline act here at the Warriors over the Wasatch Air Show, scheduled for a 3:30 p.m. start. So we hope. You can make your way out here. Uh, you can watch all day here, of course, on the KSL 5 TV app and the Hill Air Force Base Facebook page. We're going to send it back out to the Air Boss so you can learn more about all these incredible acts that are in the air. When you are legal to solo, he soloed in his grandfather's 1928 Travel Air 4000 biplane. To date, this pilot has flown over 85 different types of aircraft. From the Piper Cub to the mighty B-29 bomber. He's a flight instructor, 5,000 hours, residing in Siloam Springs, Arkansas. Setting up for the sectional roll, cutting a pie into eight equal parts, hesitating on that roll every 45 degrees. Well, Matt grew up like his talented father before him, flying RC aircraft, or radio control aircraft. It gave both his father and this pilot a great advantage when they got into the real thing. They understood controls, they understood aerodynamics, they understood balance. And it made it much easier to learn aerobatics. Coming in over our right shoulder for an outstanding photo pass. Get a load of this. There is the office of Matt Yonker.
This particular model aircraft came off the assembly line at the Beechcraft Corporation in Wichita, Kansas in 1943, the wartime years. It was bought new by the United States Army Air Corps. It spent the duration of the war as a navigational trainer. It was based at Ellington Field in Houston, Texas. All right, now, if you want to talk about great control, Matt has slowed the aircraft up. He has lowered the landing gear. He has put the flaps down, 6,000 pound airplane. She is a big girl. But Matt is gonna do a little dance with this big girl. And you might recognize this song as he tips it up to 90 degrees or more. He is dancing with an elephant. This is the Elephant Waltz. These were a very popular airplane, not only in the military, but in the, the civilian world as well. For many years, aircraft like this, the Beach 18, <laughs> crisscrossed the country at all hours of the night. They carried airmail, they carried freight, they carried film, they carried car parts and other boxes and bags throughout all weather conditions. And by the way, not going was not an option for countless flyers, many of whom may be in the audience today. Matt would like to dedicate this performance to our active duty military members, veterans, and to all of the salty old pilots who cut their teeth on these fantastic airplanes. Now, minimum speed, gear down, flaps down, just above the stall, and that's when the wings will no longer support the aircraft in the air. It is a balancing act. When Matt received the Art Scholl Award via Zoom in the COVID year, we couldn't get together. He gave a lot of credit for the aircraft staying in the air for the innovation of their nighttime act when they turned the airplane into a spaceship with millions of LED lights. He said, I could not do this act without Jeff Gibbs, my crew chief. Jeff's with us here now. And each and every show, Jeff is up here to guide me. Thank you so much for being a part of this award-winning team, Jeff Gibbs. Ah, oh, yes, a little fun with music, as if I see an elephant fly, that's the theme song for this 1943 6,000-pound machine, having a little fun on the landing and rollout.
All right, changing the pace from 1943 and the big twin engine trainer and transport aircraft. And by the way, passenger aircraft of the award-winning Matt Yonkin. Now we're going to go to the world of military aircraft and present the FA-18 Hornet. That is the Super Hornet. And we're also going to present after that, forming up with the T-2 Buckeye, the Navy Legacy Flight. So we'll get ready to change the place as variety is the key to every air show. We want to entertain you the best way possible. So uh, those aircraft getting into position, if you want to take a little break, if you have to go to the facility, it'll be a few minutes. And again, stay comfortable, stay hydrated. Uh, suntan, sun blocker, suntan lotion, and lip protection. I worry about you so much. Very soon you'll hear the aircraft taking off. First aircraft taking off will be the Navy T-2 Buckeye aircraft. It will be going out to hold to be ready for the second portion of the flying routine. That is the legacy portion. So you'll see it red and white out on the runway low and to your left. And then the FA-18 will start its routine right after the T-2 Buckeye has cleared the area. Ladies and gentlemen, today the West Coast Rhino Demo Team dedicates this performance to Lieutenant Max Bullock. And our message to Lieutenant Max Bullock, we have the watch. On behalf of the United States Navy, Naval Air Station Lemoore, and Commander Strike Fighter Wing Pacific, and Commanding Officer of Strike Fighter Squadron 122, we are proud to present the West Coast FA-18 Super Hornet Flight Demonstration. Intended to replace the retired F-14 Tomcat and the aging Legacy Hornets, the Boeing-built FA-18 Super Hornet is the Navy's frontline tactical aircraft. Known as the Rhino, the Super Hornet builds on the combat-proven design of the original Hornet with improvements such as a 30% larger surface area, larger payload, longer range capability, and increased weapons lethality. The aircraft we're flying for you today is the F model, which incorporates a two-place cockpit to accomplish the assigned missions. Our pilots today our Lieutenant Ryan Thurman, call sign James from Seattle, Washington. He's an old buddy. And uh, Weapon System Officer, Lieutenant Thomas Yu, call sign Hoods from Bellevue, Washington. 
He's been my reel here for the last two days. All right, those are your crew members. We'll call them huds and jeans if you don't mind. That's their call sign. That's what they prefer. All right, ladies and gentlemen, direct your attention to the left. 44,000 pounds of thrust, 130 miles per hour takeoff speed. They'll perform a 360 degree roll. While Demonstrating to you what they call the dirty roll, demonstrating the superior power and maneuverability of the Rhino. Now, after climbing through 4,000 feet, the aircraft will, the air crew will perform a one-half Cuban 8 maneuver, or a half loop. They'll roll upright and demonstrate the Super Hornet's incredible pitch authority by fully squatting the jet and stopping its descent in an instant. What does the squat mean? Well, watch. Watch for the squat. There it is right there. The Super Hornet is unique in its ability to operate at slow speeds and high angles of attack. The superior flight control computers allow the pilot to position the aircraft. Where and when he needs to. Observe now how the aircraft rotates 180 degrees while in a nearly flat attitude, aptly named the Flat Pirouette. The Super Hornet's engines produce over 44,000 pounds of thrust in full afterburner. This allows the aircraft to sustain eight times the force of gravity in a very tight turn radius. Whether in a dogfight or aborting surface terror missiles, the ability of the Super Hornet to turn in a very tight space gives it a tremendous tactical advantage. Radius turn to the vertical tail stand. All right, Jeeves and Huds now setting up for the high speed pass to an idle vertical climb. During this maneuver, the aircraft will approach at nearly Mach 1, demonstrating the use of speed to surprise the enemy. You may notice the white vapor coming out of the jet, indicating that it is close to the speed of sound. Keep in mind, the speed that they are flying is nearly only one half of the aircraft's maximum speed. I direct your attention to the right as the Super Hornet approaches, accelerating towards the speed of sound. speeds from the cockpit. You heard 625 miles per hour. <laughs> and again, only half the, half the speed capability of the aircraft. Exactly. Let's now pull the aircraft into the vertical and quickly point the jet back to the earth to re 
orientate for the next maneuver, the vertical, stop it, slow down, vertical pirouette, easy for you to say, entering the maneuver at 350 miles per hour, they'll pull the jet to the vertical, roll the canopy towards the crowd, selecting full afterburner, the airspeed will slow to 220 miles an hour, and they'll perform a very enjoyable negative G pushover and set up for the vertical pirouette. As they pull the nose grab to the up, watch how the aircraft swaps from nose high to nose low, rapidly pointing back towards the ground. Ladies and gentlemen, the Super Hornet vertical pirouette. the aircraft will be setting up for my favorite maneuver. It's called the square loop or the box in the sky. Selecting afterburner as the air, as the jet approaches air show center, they will reposition the nose four times while flying a square box through the sky. As the Rhino approaches from your right, they will accelerate the aircraft to 450 miles per hour at an altitude of 500 feet, approaching show center. They'll roll the aircraft inverted, reduce power to idle, and hold level attitude. you're right, the inverted whisper has. <laughs> Lieutenants Jeeves and Hudds now setting up for the high alpha pass. This maneuver will showcase the incredible slow speed handling characteristics of the Super Hornet. Sometimes the aircraft with the ability to fly the slowest will have the advantage in air-to-air -air combat as the potential adversary may be forced to fly in front of the fighter, thus becoming defensive. Few other aircraft in the world would attempt this maneuver at this slow speed and nose-high attitude. The 40,000-pound F.A. 18 Hornet remains completely controllable at less than 100 miles per hour with the two digital flight control computers aiding the air crew. From your left, we'll go to the cockpit for the Super Hornet High Alpha Pass.
Ladies and gentlemen, watch as James and Hutz roll the aircraft inverted, point right back to Earth, set up for the next maneuver. The aircraft will be approaching from your right. The air crew will demonstrate the incredible pitch authority of the Super Hornet approaching show center. They'll roll the aircraft 90 degrees, angle the bank, and abruptly pull away from the crowd, showcasing the Rhino's ability to change direction quickly. Now setting up for the touch and go landing as they circle the land, they'll ensure that the gear locks in the down position. The flaps are extended to enhance lift at the slower speed required for the landing. Once lined up with the runway or in the groove, they'll slow the on this they'll slow to on speed angle of attack, which is how Navy tail hook aircraft determine their landing speed. This on speed AOA correctly positions the aircraft's hook to engage a wire aboard a nuclear aircraft carrier at sea. After the touch and go, the aircraft accelerates a few feet above the ground to reach its minimum vertical speed. Whether to quickly climb out of a forward deployed airbase or expeditiously get altitude out of surface to air missile range, they'll pull back out the controls, stick the aircraft nearly to the vertical position. Now the two aircraft that you saw earlier are going to get uh, are going to get back into position as we get ready for the F-A-18 T-2 Legacy flight. As America progresses through the 21st century, it becomes increasingly important that we reflect on our nation's proud history, people, events, and technological advances, which have made our country great by remembering, appreciating, and fully understanding the touchstones of our past, will we be able to successfully chart the course for America's future? With this thought in mind, Commander Naval Forces developed the Tailhook Legacy Flight, a dynamic flight demonstration program designed to keep naval aviation's ties to its proud heritage alive and viable. Under this program, vintage warbirds from naval aviation's past are flown alongside the high-tech weaponry representative of present-day naval carrier aviation. Through these unique formation flight demonstrations, we hope to provide inspiration for the men and women who currently serve, attracting the best and brightest of the next generation of young Americas to join the future ranks of naval aviation. During World War II, the battles of the Coral Sea and Midway, the full capabilities of Navy tactical air power began to be realized. It was from this time that the course of naval carrier aviation changed forever. Although it has been 
Nearly 80 years since the conclusion of World War II, Navy tactical aviation has transformed in many different ways. Today, the T-2 Buckeye will be leading the tailhook legacy flight. Although the T-2 Buckeye has never seen combat, it has been the backbone for Navy and Marine Corps tactical jet crew training starting back in 1959. It has served as a stepping stone to esteemed aircraft such as the F-4, the F-14 for naval aviators. Officially retired in 2008, the Navy T-2 Buckeye has been in service for 50 years. Every tactical jet naval aviator from the Vietnam War to the global war on terror has flown the T-2 Buckeye. During the course of the air show season, different aircraft will alternatively, alternatively participate in tailhook legacy flight flyovers. The pilots who fly these vintage warbirds join the tailhook legacy flight program on a strictly volunteer basis. Please take a moment to stop by and visit them after the show and thank them for sharing naval aviation history with us here today. We invite you now to turn around and look up as the legacy flight passes directly overhead for the split break. Now recovering aircraft that are going to be coming back here. And 
by the way, you'll see that some of our performers, I would say mostly the civilians, may not be landing here after their performance, either going to make it back home or try to get towards home or position over to the Ogden Airport for an early morning departure, getting back to their home bases or their next air show destination. So a number of aircraft in the air, some of which have to land, others getting ready to take off, others taxiing out, heading for another location. And remember, if you're purchasing a gift for yourself, you have come to the right place. Wearing apparel, high quality, great prices. We don't pay mall rents. Only at air shows are these items offered. It is great for you, and if you're looking for shopping for an upcoming occasion, a birthday, an anniversary, or a graduation, or as Super Dave Olmsted likes to say, 182 days until Christmas, not so early Christmas shopping, just as Dave said, remember where you put it over the top once again. This is the place to do your shopping, and if hunger is what's eating you, you've come to the right place as well. Your favorite air show food item is here, your favorite beverage is here, the T2 Buckeye is landing and rolling out, Brad Worsen's ready to take off, the fa 18 is ready to come in and land, we have a busy sky. And while we're doing all that, if you have to make a run to the facilities, you can do that now, and get back quickly for the next bit of variety. The job of naval aviator is not complete until their aircraft is back aboard its floating home. The aircraft. He's looking out the left and right side of the canopy at the horizon to maintain an angle that he is trying to desire from straight up. Now straight down after a series of rolls. Pull up to the vertical. Roll the aircraft one quarter roll, another quarter roll, a third quarter roll, the four point ascending vertical climb. Spoke goes off, Re vertical reverse, the hammerhead, the snap roll on the descending line twice. All right, pulling back on the stick to a grueling six times the force of gravity at least. The aircraft stops, shifts into reverse, backs up on the tail, recovering with the weight of the nose and the prop and the pilot maintaining the controls to a nose down attitude. What you're seeing is a choreographed sky dance. These are just not random maneuvers that are thrown together. They are rehearsed, they are practiced to be able, without a break, to do the turnarounds in the stage area, to do the maneuvers in the stage area, and but to have the altitude and the speed to do the next maneuver. That is planning. It's a unique sky dance that each one of these pilots do differently based on their favorite maneuvers, based on the capability of the aircraft, and based on how the pilot feels about the whole routine. This sky dance is unique from all others. Brad Worston is the dedicated pilot snap rolling the aircraft. Multiple snap roll. The British call that maneuver the flick roll. It takes about as long to get around as snapping your finger. Brad is working with the Ryan P. Hole Foundation. It's a youth program to elevate your life. It was founded by air show performer, our late friend Greg Poe, as a result of a tragic drug-related death of his son, Ryan J. Poe. Yeah, Foundation mission statement, utilize aviation to inspire, motivate, and provide a path for young people to realize their dreams. The encouragement that these people receive to follow their dreams has truly 
been a lifelong dream of this man, Brad Worcester. are gyroscopic maneuvers. The airplane takes a tremendous speeding. For that reason, they are comprised of space-age materials. They are light but not flimsy. Continuous high G, both negative and positive on the aircraft, take its toll on most aircraft. But with space-age materials, as Brad does a little dance on the rudder, spins it off on top, smoke deliberately off, back for his line. Brain is racing 400 miles an hour. Where am I? What position am I in? Where do I need to go next? This comes after many, many lonely hours of rehearsal, usually with a ground crew member on the ground and a camera. Half roll, then gyroscopic turnaround then force the airplane to fly it does not want to fly it wants to mush you can see the smoke billowing up behind the aircraft brad right there got some buffeting in the cockpit because the wing is telling him i can't fly you're forcing me to do something i don't want to do all right dynamite and danny is on discreet brad are you on discreet Uh, Rick Myers and I are ready for you. I got one more maneuver here. We're going to do what I call the slider. All right, from the ground level, we'll watch for him to gain altitude, put the airplane on its side, and gain altitude while sliding from right to left. Then rolling the aircraft off the top at minimum speed. Then descending for two lengths of the airplane, and then looking down at the pyro field below him. Rick Myers. All right, Rick. Pyrotechnic crew, firewalkers. The guys out there on the field, I think they shouldn't be there at this time. Well, we always get intruders, but uh, be nice to them. Uh, they have, uh, let's say they have made their presence known earlier today, Brett. Be careful. Hey, what are you going to start flying? Oh, I haven't seen you down yet here. Now that's Rick Myers on the crown. It's like a matador waving the red flag. Oh, wait, Brad Thurston laid down a bomb. <laughs> wait, who's bombing who?
offerings in the sky. Right through the ring, Brad Worston. Right on the target, right on the bullseye. Little friendly rivalry between Rick Myers, the guy they call Sarge. And his experienced crew with over 150 hours, 150 years, that is, a pyrotechnic experience again through, through the smoke rings in the sky. But these guys are just having fun. That's all they're doing. It's all about fun. And they're sharing that fun with you. Friend, friendly rivalry. One wing up, one wing down, spoiling the lift of those wings. Lying on the fuselage in a ballistic pattern, much like a bullet does. been cleared for landing and again keep you interchanged. All right, Brad Worston in his MX wowing the crowd. A lot of pyrotechnics. Dan Hawkins alongside Matt Gephardt. And Matt, it has been a lot of fun. Lots of great acts and we still got some really great acts coming up. It has been so cool to be out here and, and watching this stuff and as the uh, the F F those are the F-14s? F-18. F-18, F-18 excuse yep. me. The F-18 that was flying over. I mean, the uh, you know they're loud, right? Anybody who lives in the, in the shadow of Hill Air Force Base know, knows that these things are loud. But to be right there as they're, you know, buzzing, for lack of a better word, buzzing the crowd and stuff, <laughs> I mean, it, it is uh, impossible not to get goosebumps. Absolutely. Now, we want to bring in our next guest, Staff Sergeant Jeremy Hansen, an Air Force recruiter. He's based in Salt Lake City, so just down the road here from Ogden, Utah and a air transportation specialist by trade, right? Yes, sir. All right. So tell us a little bit about yourself and, and your Air Force story. So I am actually from Salt Lake. Uh, I grew up in Riverton. Um, and then I joined when I was about 24 years old. Ended up uh, with Germany as my first assignment. So I ended up staying there for five years. Uh, I did air transportation, which is helping load and unload uh, cargo and passengers on aircraft. And then after that, they sent me to Virginia traveled up and down the East Coast, and then I became a recruiter, and I'm based out of Taylorsville. You, you are a recruiter. Yes, sir. Make the sales pitch. So the big thing with the Air Force is, you know, we are able to help people get a good, solid career, get them a lot of benefits, uh, help pay for education, and get them in a solid trajectory for their life. You know, even if they serve four years or 24 years, it really helps them get on a good path for their career field. So obviously there's a lot of different ways or paths you can take, whether it's, you know, joining the Air Force enlisted, which is what you handle, but there's also different paths for officers and even professionals, right? Absolutely. Like lawyers, doctors, doctors yes. et cetera. Um, you know, can you just kind of maybe just give a broad overview of, of maybe um, kind of the different paths that, that people can take and, and then maybe focus in specifically on um, en enlistment specifically? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so, yeah, we have two major aspects of the – well, three aspects of the Air Force. We have enlisted, we have officer, and we have civilian. Uh, for enlisted, it really just requires a high school education. Uh, and then for officer, you have to have a bachelor's degree. That's the bare minimum. It still takes a lot to get it from there. Um, and then our civilian force, we are, wouldn't be anywhere without them because they, they stay afterwards where we are constantly moving from one base to another. Um, so they kind of help with uh, um, continuity and making sure we have everything going every, uh, throughout our, our bases and everything. Uh, you, you mentioned that there's lots of different jobs. I mean, really, almost every civilian job in some aspect is, is, is it becomes a part of the Air Force and, and so much of the Air Force is civilian. Um, but I would imagine in your recruiting role, you get a lot of people. We, we, we interviewed 
what a great job we have. We've been interviewing fighter pilots all morning, right? <laughs> um, for every one of them, there's you know, 15, 20, 30 men and women Absolutely. on the tarmac. Um, I would imagine people who walk into your office and say, or, or to a certain extent say, I want to fly. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is the minority, not the majority. Yeah, only 4% of the Air Force actually flies. The other 96% stay on the ground to support them from various roles of aircraft mechanics to the cyber people to medical to our personnelists and our finance people. Um, everyone has a position, and we need to have all those positions to make sure we're able to support our air mission. Uh, you're one of the major employers here in Utah. Uh, it, it's funny, every time I, I in my civilian job go out and, and I, I conduct interviews, uh, uh, you know, every, I meet people every day who work on the air. Oh, do you know so-and-so? Do you know so-and-so? No. I mean, this is, <laughs> it's, like, it's like Utah's like, third largest city or something Absolutely. like that. I mean, it's, it's a major thing up here. It is, it is a major operation. It's a major mission. Yeah, I mean, we have, I believe, 300-some-odd thousand people in the Air Force for active duty alone. Uh, we also have our reserve counterparts and our Air National Guard counterparts that work part-time, and then our civilian force. So we have a very large amount of people, um, and it, it, we get at that a lot. You know, people ask us, oh, hey, do you know so-and-so? And, you know, there's <laughs> probably several, you know, tens of thousands of people stationed at Hill Air Force Base, and it's hard to know them all. So true story. Yeah. Uh, I got recruited out of a small high school in Iowa. Three of my classmates joined the Air Force alongside with me. My recruiter was actually security forces. Uh, he was a staff sergeant. Fast forward 10 years, I'm stationed in Osan, Korea. And who's the mass sergeant flight chief that I work for <laughs> in the same cop squadron? My recruiter. True story. I'm not making That's that That's awesome. Is it, is, it, <laughs> is it, Dan, is it a brotherhood? I mean, you, I, I imagine in the military, and you see the movies, right? It's, it's brotherhood, the sisterhood uh, within within a unit, within a barracks, what have you. Um, but but one thing about the military is is it, it is, it, it breaks up, right? It, it's, you know, you'll be in, in, my neighbor, you know, was in Salt Lake City for, for two and a half years uh, working here at Hill Air Force Base, and now he's in Mississippi, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, uh, and it's, um, is it, uh, but, Everyone is working towards the same mission yeah. of, of national security. Uh, talk about the brother of both of you, the brotherhood, the sisterhood of, of, of being in the armed forces. Well, I think a big part of it is everyone has gone through the same thing you have. You know, all the enlisted force yeah. has gone through basic training. They've gone through that experience. For our officers, they've gone through field training or the academy or OTS, officer training school. So everyone has that foundation that we can fall on and then as well you know everybody's gone through similar experiences we've gone through a move through the military we've gone through our tech school training you know we've gone through all these experiences and how to deal with the same things so it absolutely helps pull us together and you you know when i uh, moved from uh, germany i did a cross-country trip and i just found a bunch of friends that had been stationed all across the the u.s and was able to stay at their places overnight you know as i'm doing that trip and i didn't have to use hotels and he was able to catch up with a bunch of people well there's a recruitment tool right there save money on vrbos <laughs> <laughs> absolutely the p51 mustang korean war era plane wowing the crowd here at the warriors over the wasatch we're here with staff sergeant jeremy hansen an air force recruiter based in salt lake city almost near the end of his recruiter tour about to go back to the operational air force as an air transportation specialist but jeremy we talked about and we touched on it some of those benefits that you talked about but what are some of the things that an air force career uh can provide men and women who enlist absolutely so one of the big things with enlisting is we have the community college of the air force Um, And that actually has a degree plan tied to every single career field in the Air Force. So that is something that, you know, you come in, you get college credit just for learning how to do your job. And then, you know, you end up only being usually about five classes away from earning your associate's degree. You're able to use tuition assistance to pay for all that. So you're not having to pay any out-of-pocket expenses. I ended up racking up $20,000 in student loans before I joined the Air Force because I made the mistake of going to a college, you know, and, and paying for that out of my own pocket. So... Um, that was one of the really big things. And then, you know, we get 30 days of vacation that is paid every year uh, that you're able to use for traveling and, you know, things like that. And that allowed me to really go like, tour through Europe, tour through the East Coast, and then come home for any of those events that we had going on, you know, weddings and, um, you know, things like that. Staff Sergeant, there's a, uh, a theme that I've noticed this morning as we've interviewed fighter pilots. Uh, they remember being five, six, seven, eight, nine years old and attending an event like this. Is this a recruitment tool? Is this a, a, 
productive recruitment tool? Are you getting Absolutely. people signing up as they walk off the base today? So for the most part, we don't actually sign people up here. We're going to talk about those benefits. We're going to um, plant that seed. And then if they have that interest, they can definitely reach out. You know, we have uh, areas where they can put their information in. But for the most part, we're here just to let people know that we're here and, you know, talk to them about those benefits and see if it's something they want to learn more about at a later point. I, w I wanted to go back to one of those benefits uh, because uh, uh, Sergeant Zaniga actually brought it up yesterday, and I think it's a great point. You talked about the education benefits and the GI Bill, but it's actually something like with tuition assistance, it's one of those benefits that you can actually transfer to members of your family. Absolutely. Yes, we have the post-911 GI Bill. Um, this is something that is basically it's over a $100,000 scholarship, and it helps pay for housing, um, so it pays for college dorm and stuff like that. And so if you're in the Air Force, you're using your tuition assistance, it'll pay all the way up to a master's degree. And so if you end up not needing to use that GI Bill, they allow you to transfer that to a spouse or any kids so that you can help pay for their college. You know, if you have one kid, it can pay for four years of school. You have two kids, it could pay for an associate's degree for each. If you have three kids, maybe decide if you love one a little bit more or try and find some way to divide it up evenly. But um, it's definitely something that's really beneficial if you end up getting all your education paid for while you're in the Air Force. So my wife is retired from the Air Force. I'm retired from the Air Force. Uh, we both use tuition assistance. Uh, we were able to put our daughter through engineering school at Texas A&M, and it got her through four years of college well, at Texas well. A&M. And we didn't have to pay for her tuition and all those things and her housing and dorm and yep all that. it was paid for through this great benefit that we were able to utilize from our service so i mean that's a real life example i mean yeah. texas a&m is not cheap yeah <laughs> uh, it's a great school for engineering and the gi bill took care of it yeah it pays 100 percent of any public in-state tuition and if it's private or out of state then it's capped it changes every year last i checked is like twenty six thousand dollars a year um, so it ends up being well over a hundred thousand dollars scholarship. Plus, you get your housing, you get a book stipend, um, you know, to help pay for those books since those are super expensive. And it's definitely something that's really beneficial. Can anybody do it? Do I have to be? I supposed to be a pilot? I have to be a certain height and a certain weight. Uh, but, but anything? I, can, can anybody? Anybody who's watching right now? No, no. I wouldn't work in the Air Force. I'm 41 and overweight. Is, or is there? Or is there a job for me? So there is a cutoff of, of 39 to be able to join the actual military aspect of the Air Force. We do have the civilian service that can hire at any point. Um, and then there are height and weight requirements. There's medical requirements. You know, if if you're you know, having a lot of medical issues, then that's something that we have a hard time dealing with with the military side because you have to worry, be able to deploy and things like that. But if you're curious on whether you're qualified without any commitment aspect of it, you're able to reach out to any recruiting office and they can run through that pre-qualification and find out if there's anything major that prevent you from joining the Air Force. And there are a lot of things that people think are disqualifying that are either waiverable or are no longer an issue, like pre-service drug use. I know that's a really common thing that a lot of people think they sh they aren't able to join if they've done that, and that is something that we're able to work around. Yeah, beautiful shots there from our second audiovisual squadron crew of the P-51 Mustang. And Sergeant Hansen, uh, obviously we've talked a lot about enlistment, but I, I wanted to just touch on uh, Air Force Special Warfare uh, because you actually got, have a program where people interested in those career fields can be physically developed before they actually ever join the Air Force and go to BMT. Can Absol you just yeah. maybe touch on that? Yeah, so um, with our special warfare program, it is a very difficult program. Um, you know, that we are trying to get the elite. And so to try and prevent people from not being physically or mentally capable of going through those technical training programs, we have this program called Development, where we're gonna work with you before you leave for basic training and help get you mentally and physically prepared to be able to go into those training pipelines and minimize the chances you're not gonna make it through. Um, and we actually have a developer in our local area. He came into the Air Force under Tactical Air Control Party, TACP, cross-trained over to combat control, and served for 26 years. And he works along with our special warfare recruiter to make sure that you are as capable as possible, that they're you know, really confident that you're going to be able to succeed through your training and prepare you all before you even leave for basic training. Is this a 24-7, if, if I'm a member of the Air Force, is it a 24-7 gig? 
it's 24-7 uh, in the aspect that, you know, you have to be available for duty at, uh, at that point, but you're really just working your shifts. You know, it's, you know, you're going to be coming in seven to four, or maybe you do some swing shifts or some night shifts, but really you're working five days a week, 40 to 45 hour weeks, and your time off is your own. You know, when you are done with work, you will go back to your room, you can sit there and play Xbox, or you can go out and travel. I chose the latter when I was in Germany, and I hit all the countries bordering Germany, plus Italy, Ireland, and Sweden. And uh, most of that was all my time off, my weekends. I used my vacation time to come home. Let me give you another fun fact. The Air Force, believe it or not, has a gaming community, mm -hmm. uh, the Air Force Gaming team and they actually just competed in the dod armed forces esports championships i mean there's a lot of cool things about the air force uh that really would appeal uh to our our younger yeah folks yeah we have the esports um we have regular sports and all of it is really you know we have various levels of it so we have you know different squadron units where it's really low level and then we have base level units and we have air force level units where they're playing against other branches so really you know if you're really good you can get work your way up to those other levels. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something that it, we have it for all aspects. So not all work and no play. No, no, no. That's right. <laughs> well, uh, to that end, though, uh, what are you a family man, sir? Yes. I have a wife and two dogs right now. We're working on kids. <laughs> Congratulations. Good luck. Uh, what's it like having a family? So having a family, it, it can be a little difficult at times, you know. Uh, you know, here I am on a Sunday when normally I'm, I'm at home and, and with the family. Tell but, us about it. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. But the, you know, having that 30 days of vacation, having your guaranteed paycheck, um, having a housing allowance that helps pay for housing, especially in this difficult housing market, um, all those things really make it beneficial. And then not to touch on or not to forget about our medical, um, the mil health insurance for the Air Force is free. Uh, we don't pay any dime into it. We don't pay for prescriptions. We don't pay uh, co-pays, deductibles. All that is covered, and we don't have to worry about anything. You know, if we end up having a kid, we don't have to worry about any hospital bills for them. Does it take a certain amount of courage to do this job? I, don't, I think there's a lot more courage stepping up than it is to actually go through it. You know, it's really hard to get that confidence to go and talk to a recruiter, to pick up that phone call, to go onto the website, put in your information. Um, and it is, you know, really stressful to think about going to basic training or yeah. officer training school or things like that. But once you get there, these programs are designed to help people succeed. You know, we aren't there to try and fail people out of these programs. We want them to succeed. And so uh, as you're going through your training, everything there is to help push you forward, not hold you back. That is one of the, I mean, Civilian freeloader here. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that I, I I know most of what I know from the movies, and it is drill sergeants, and, and I know that's army, but but it's it's um, it is intimidating. Some of the some yeah. of what we see in pop culture, uh, and uh, but but it is also an encouraging atmosphere to, to go through. Uh, I suppose any branch of the military, but your experience with the Air Force? Yeah, so, I mean, in basic training, you're going to get yelled at. Uh, and <laughs> and the, the thing that I realized, though, is they're not yelling at you. I mean, yes, it's directed at you, but really they're speaking loud enough so everybody learns that lesson. You know, if you make a mistake, they don't want everybody to keep making that mistake, so they're going to speak loud enough so 60 people can hear and not repeat that same mistake later on. And the first two weeks of basic training is the worst because you're making all these mistakes. You don't know what you're supposed to be doing. And so as you learn those mis from those mistakes and stop making them, it gets easier. And you also kind of get used to it. You know, when you first go to high school, it's super overwhelming. By the time you're a senior, you just, you're, you're sitting back and take, you know, and, and able to just walk through it. And it's the same thing with basic training. And there's a great series out on YouTube. It was done by the third audio visual squadron. It's called basic. And you can actually go watch it on YouTube. If you just Google it up and it will take you from, Day one, all the way through the end yep. of basic training. And it was just shot like two years ago, so it's pretty... Some of it was during COVID, so yeah, it's some... really up to date Yeah, um, and really gives you a solid picture on what's going on in basic training today. And it actually follows a few people through. Some people make it, some people don't. Um, but you get to see their story and see what happened and get that experience and help prepare you for it. You know, And it was something that didn't exist when I went through. When people walk into your office... Are you able to tell that guy, that gal is going to make it? So when people walk into my office, as, as bad as it sounds, you know, first thing I'm doing is looking them up and down and see, hey, you know, you're probably outside of height and weight standards. Um, and 
you know, but the majority of people that go through do make it. I mean, like I said, the program's designed to have, uh, to get people through. It's very rare that somebody doesn't make it. Most of the time it's due to um, pre-existing issues that flare up or medical issues that are found while they're there. Um, it's very rare for somebody to fail out because of um, not cutting it for the, the physical aspect of it or, you know, not passing the academic portion because they're designed to get people through. Yeah, so tons of great information, and there's a lot of different ways that people could reach out, uh, not just physically in the office. Can you talk about some of the yeah. ways? So we have airforce.com. That's our official recruiting website. Um, on there, they have, con you know, you can throw in your zip code. You can find out a recruiter. They have a chat. They have a 1-800 number, or you can even just go to Google and, you know, find on Google Maps. We have all our recruiting offices located on there with uh, phone numbers where you can talk to a direct recruiter. Um, yeah, there's a lot of different ways you can reach out to your recruiter and, or to somebody involved in the recruiting process to be able to start answering some of those questions. All right. Well, we certainly appreciate your time today and, uh, you know, best of luck as you transition back to the operational Air Force. But thanks for what you do for our nation. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Good to meet you. All right. You see the great pictures of Paul Strickland flying and fun fact, uh, Matt. Uh, the current pilot out there flying that aircraft right now, Paul Strickland, used to be an Air Force Thunderbird. Really? Yeah. So pretty cool. He's uh, actually a pilot now for Southwest Airlines. And, and so uh, wowing the crowd here, but he has over 3,000 hours uh, in military aircraft, uh, obviously including the F-16, but also the A-10. So pretty cool stuff. All right, and so next time my Southwest flight catches a couple of Gs, I can just assume that it's Mr. Strickland behind the I, uh, yoke. Yeah, I, yeah. I was going to say I had a couple of flights recently that now it all kind of comes together. Yeah, you get off sense. and it's like you were a fighter pilot, weren't you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it makes a ton of sense. So you can see the great pictures of the crowd. And look at that crowd. It's still continuing to file it. Kind of the same flight path is yesterday as the day went on and we got closer to the Thunderbirds, the headlining act, the, the, the little blank spaces that are getting fewer and far further between filled up. Yeah, well, there's no bad seat in the house because, you know, unlike a stage show, everything's happening above you, or I suppose like a stage show, right? There's no bad seat in the house. Everything's happening to your, uh, I suppose what you would call it, north to your above, to your, and uh, it, it's... I, I got to tell you, I mean, this is my first. This is my first air show, and as they, as the F-18s were flying over Top Gun music, playing through the PA system, and and uh, it really doesn't do justice to just how noisy <laughs> these things can be. Uh, the whole earth shakes. I mean, it's it's it feels like an earthquake. Uh, the hair on my arms is still standing up. It's it's really a cool experience out here. Well, I'm really glad you enjoyed your your day with us. I know Dan Spindle's about ready to come on and, and take your leave. But any parting thoughts before before you head out? Thank you, thank you to you. Nice to meet you. Thank you to you. Thank you to the Air Force. Um, it's uh, it's really a cool experience out here. I when the, when they asked if I was available to do it, I went, oh, sure, that sounds fun. Uh, I I really. In my mind's eye, I underestimated how fun this really, you know, we had an hour break a minute ago, and I just stood out there with my mouth, catching flies in my mouth with my jaw, just watching these things go around. It's, uh, it's really a cool experience. So th thank you to you. Thank you to the Air Force. Uh, thank you to KSL for giving me a job that allows me to have this kind of experience. I'm, I, I feel very grateful. Awesome. Thank you so much. Let's learn a little bit more about how officers can be recruited into the Air Force. The Gold Bar program is pretty unique because it offers newly commissioned second lieutenants a one-year special duty purely focused on recruiting for Air Force ROTC. Now the Gold Bars are able to get outside of the university and reach out into the local community that focused on proctoring tests, um, volunteering, helping on the base, and heading up base events as well. This has allowed us to now utilize Air Force Recruiting Services to where we can better reach out to the community um, through local community involvement events, through reaching high schools and universities, and by collaborating to conduct total force recruiting efforts. If you aspire to be something, look out for a mentor, someone who can guide you along the way, and be that visible person for someone in the future.